anyway, uh, I'm John Anderson from Duluth, just across the bay from Superior. Uh, Superior was a little town over there. <laughs> and uh, Duluth uh, is a wonderful place to grow up, but it was a bad place to stay after the war was over because the mines were closing down, the timber was just about all through, and uh, so most of my buddies and I had to leave Duluth to find employment, and that's why I ended up down here in the Twin City area. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming uh, today, the nice turnout, that mailing I sent out must have done some good. I'm just, I'm just fooling now. Uh, but it is a nice group, to, uh, and I uh, was kind of talking to my wife, telling her what I was going to talk about. And I tell her that I came from Duluth and graduated from dear old Deckfeld, one of the nicest high schools you ever want to see. If you get up in Duluth sometime, it's just a couple of blocks from where the bomb bridge ends up in Duluth. And uh, our class went back there for a class reunion, and the same uh, lockers and, and the uh, auditorium, the seats in the auditorium. There's no damage done to them. The lockers are still the same old lockers they were back in 1940. And it's just beautiful to see uh, how it can be preserved if the people in the area take care of it. So that's enough about Duluth. I, uh, I couldn't find a job when I graduated from high school. I had an opportunity to go to Tacoma, Washington. I was in a welding school in Duluth and halfway through, and this uh, gentleman that was dating my cousin said, would any of you fellows be interested in uh, helping me drive out to Tacoma, Washington? Well, like a screwball, I said, sure, I would. I, the farthest away from Duluth I had ever been was up in the Iron Range and uh, down to Minneapolis twice, and uh, over to Ironwood, Michigan. We played them in football, and I was a football player. So that's as far away from Duluth as I've gotten. And here I said, and he says, I'm leaving in the morning. So I went and took my $50 out of my bank and closed the account. Went over to J.C. Penney and bought a little tin uh, <laughs> suitcase. It was supposed to look like it had straps on it. It was <laughs> leather. <laughs> and it was just big enough for some underwear and my pajamas. And I was off for Tacoma, Washington. We drove from Monday morning until Friday afternoon, and he let me out in front of a hotel there, and he says, goodbye, here's my telephone number if you want to call me. So I went in and checked into the hotel. Didn't know a soul from on the West Coast all the way back to Duluth. I, I was <laughs> uh, just a crazy young kid. Why I did that, I don't know because I had no job out there, nobody uh, to help me get a job. But uh, when Monday came, I uh, went down the industrial flats where all the, uh, the uh, industry was, and I started going around from place to place, telling them I was a welder. And uh, one guy says, you got to be an art welder and an electric welder, or a, a gas welder. So why don't you go over to the Todd Shipbuilding Corporation? It's, it's huge. They got 23 ways. They're building 23 ships at a time over there. They're hiring arc welders. So I did. I went over there and they gave me six plates, uh, or, uh, thick steel, and I. They said, well, two of them flat, two vertical, and two overhead. Uh, I did this and uh, they put them in a machine and kept bending them and bending them and until they finally broke them. They uh, decided that I was a good enough welder to hire, so they told the uh, personnel the officer that, uh, to hire me, and so they said, you're hired, but you've got to join the union. So they told me where the union hall was, and I went up there, and they said, sure, uh, you can join but you have to have 50 bucks for <laughs> so uh, for the initiation fee. So I called my friend John, who I'd driven out with, and he said he'd loan me the $50, and, uh, but he wanted it back right away. So 
I said, well, I understand they're paying good wages, so I'll give it to you as soon as I get my first paycheck. And it was $73 a week that I was going to be making. That was three times what my friends back in Duluth were getting, working in the steel plant and different places around Duluth. But uh, anyway, I spent March through December 1942 out there working in the Todd Shipbuilding Corporation, building these ships. And uh, then my mother got in touch with me and said the draft board was quite interested in me. <laughs> and uh, so I got home about the middle of December, 42, and uh, when do came down here to Minneapolis, Fort Snelling, and was inducted on uh, December 19th. And of course, they gave you a little time off so you could spend Christmas at home. And from there on, I uh, was, uh, came down to, or was sent down to uh, Florida, St. Petersburg and Clearwater for basic. And there I was, I, a kid that had never left Minnesota, really. I had gone from one corner of the U.S. to the other corner. And uh, it was a real experience to be able to cover so much of the country in such a short time. So I took my basic down there in Clearwater, and then uh, I wanted to be uh, a uh, work. Oh, and by the way, I, uh, the test that I had taken said that I was qualified to be an engineer or a mechanic, and so I was sent to uh, AM school at Amarillo. Finished there in August of 40. 43, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, signed up for gunnery and went to Las Vegas and finished gunnery there in the middle of October and, and uh, had a delay en route, so I went to where my sweetheart was in Detroit on, on my little delay en route uh, and uh, got engaged and back to Salt Lake and uh, met my crew who uh, Incidentally, I've got a couple of books here, uh, the, my 385th bomb group. Anyway, you want to look through that, and I got the picture of my crew. We were a uh, bunch of guys, three of them were from Texas, three from California, and one from Oregon. I was from Minnesota, and one from Wisconsin, one from Iowa, one from uh, uh, Michigan, and one from New York. We were scattered all over the country, and. Uh, one day when we were flying combat, we got to talking to uh, one of the guys said, do you guys pray when you're flying in, on these missions? And we all agreed, we all prayed. One fellow was Jewish from New York. There were three Baptists, uh, I forget how many Lutherans and Catholics, they were predominant, and uh, one Mormon. So we were really a cross country or a cross section of the country, quite a variety. But uh, you know, they talk about you know atheists and foxholes. I guess there's no atheists in <laughs> in the B-17 either. But uh, we we had a wonderful crew. We uh, were very uh, close together. We would sit and discuss things, and it was. Uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me. But before we got overseas, I'd like to tell you about the uh, way we got overseas. We went the southern route. Any of you fellows, when you went to Europe, go the southern route. That was, uh, we left Carney, Nebraska, went down to, uh, to uh, West Palm Beach, from there to Trinidad and uh, Fort Lisa, Brazil, and uh, Belém, and then across to um, Dakar, Africa. That was a 12-hour flight, I remember. And uh, then up to Marrakesh, where our pilot opened an envelope that told us whether we were going to go to the 15th or the 8th. And for some reason, we never, none of us had ever been to either place, but we wanted to go to England. <laughs> and I guess it was because it, it passes to London. And, uh, Anyway, that, that trip was really fun. We left in January, of course, up in Rapid City, 
and uh, and to Carnley, and then to be able to uh, be in that southern climate. And we uh, every place we went uh, was terrific. It was they treated you well, and the food was marvelous. Um, oh, I, uh, when we got to Trinidad, uh, I. Somehow or other, I don't know why, this is just a crazy thing. I, I decided to steal four sheets off the beds when we were leaving. And the guys all laughed at me. What do you want sheets for? When we get overseas, they'll offer, they'll give you sheets. And uh, so when we got to England, I was the only guy that had sheets. They, they, they were issued uh, that itchy wool, English wool blankets. And uh, everybody was waiting for old John Anderson to get shot down so they could get his sheets. <laughs> but I never did. I, uh, our crew, uh, when we got together, we, we were an unusual crew, I think, because we, not one guy was injured in any way or did we get sick or lose uh, any missions. We all, uh, the crew just flew right on up to June 3rd Two, three days before D-Day, of course we didn't know D-Day was three days away, but we hit our 25th mission, and you, if you know anything about the rules, 25 meant you were through. Well, then they said, no, you're not through. You fly until we tell you you're through. <laughs> and then uh, they finally, of course, morale wasn't too good after that, but then they said, well, you fly 35 missions, but if you've got 25, you can go home for 30 days. And uh, uh, the, the crew decided to do that, but they kept flying us. And so when we got up to 30, the crew said, no, I, we're, not, we're not gonna go back uh, home. We only got five more to go. But three of us still decided to go home. And uh, that was a good decision because uh, when we got, uh, that was the summer of 44, and Patton finally broke through and was going through France so fast that they couldn't keep them supplied with gasoline. And so on August 30th, they had a big meeting and they told us, you guys in the 8th Air Force don't have to go back to England, and uh, but you guys in the 9th do. <laughs> so, so there was a lot of happy guys and a lot of sad guys. But anyway, it worked out the way we had figured. If the invasion was successful, why we wouldn't have to go back. But uh, there's um, uh, oh when when I was on this 30-day furlough in the states, uh, it started when we got to uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and uh, when I came back, my uh, Baltimore gunner had picked up syphilis somewhere, and he, so he was in a VD ward getting shots for five days, and uh, for some reason I ended up coming back from my 30 day furlough one day late, and the whole group that was uh, together, they had been sent off for five days, an additional five days, and I came back late, and uh, the reason I tell you this was, have you ever heard of the Armed Forces Network? They had a radio show. And the Wayne King, the Walls King, was uh, the, kind of the head man. And when I got back there, they said, uh, you're it. And I, I said, oh, what do you mean I'm it? Well, all the rest of the guys are gone. You're the only guy that's returned from overseas. And so you are going to be at a show on the Armed Forces Network. <laughs> and uh, so... I said, what, what do I have to do? And they gave me a script to read, and it was written by the Air Force. It sounded like I'd won the war myself. And so I, I said, I can't read that to Wayne King. And he says, well, tell you what, uh, you adjust it so that it fits you. Because uh, I said, somebody may hear if it's going to go all over the country. And somebody that knows me may hear it, and they'll say that Anderson, he's still full of baloney. And, uh, so uh, he let me rewrite the script so that it didn't spoil the script. It was the same message got through that they were bringing the boys home and uh, sending new recruits overseas to replace us. 
Little did they know that I was going back overseas. <laughs> I didn't tell them that. <laughs> but anyway, it was a fun time and uh, to be with uh, a guy like Wayne King. He was a peach of a guy. They, they called him the Walls King, you remember? And uh, he really treated me nice. And then uh, I, I got married on this 30-day furlough. And I, so I took my bride with me to Atlantic City. When we waited to be shipped back overseas. And then uh, the, the good news was I never had to go. So uh, I'm uh, just checking my notes here to make sure I don't forget anything that I wanted to tell you fellas about my experiences. Uh, the thing I could never remember was, or never figure out was, our crew flew their 35 missions and not a scratch or nobody even got the flu or got a cold. So we flew together as a crew, and uh, uh, one of the crews we trained with in Rapid City, they were uh, we went to Augsburg, Germany on our first mission, and they were flying right off our wing, and we were attacked by fighters, and they were shot down before they ever got to the target. And uh, I found out years later that two of the fellows, the co-pilot and the navigator, were killed as the planes attacked us. And here we are, you know how close we uh, we flew together. Why them and not us? You know, that kind of an idea. And uh, so they never reached Augsburg, never dropped their bombs. And uh, we flew our full missions and not a scratch on any one of us. And I, I uh, if any of you fellows want to read a book, this uh, Truman Smith, it's, it's in our library here, uh, Bob's at, Tom Stillwell, and uh, he saw me and he, he found out I was in the 385th, and this is written by a co-pilot from the 385th, and it's, uh, there's about 12 missions that he and I flew on together that I didn't know him at the time, but I called him the other day trying to find a, a copy of my own that I can, <laughs> that I can have, and uh, because it's so interesting, I never kept Actor. I, I kept records of his missions, but not detailed, like this guy did. So uh, if you want to read about what the 385th did, and uh, this is my, like a yearbook, <laughs> the 385th, and uh, uh, I hope I, I let you know a little bit about what my, uh, experiences were. I told my buddies over at my table that this is the first time I've done any public speaking since I was a, the, uh, uh, the chairman of the church <laughs> back about 20 years ago. And uh, at annual meetings, you got to get up and speak to the church. So if if uh, I haven't done a good job, why you, you, it's because I <laughs> been a rookie. <laughs> I think you did real fine, and we appreciate you getting up.